Chapter 28, Magnetic Fields. Remember the four basic forces in the universe. Strong force, which we don't study in this class. Weak force, which we don't study. Gravitational force, which we studied in Physics 211. And the electromagnetic force. We studied the electric force. Now we're going to look at the magnetic force. Both the electric force and the magnetic force are basically two sides of the same coin. Let's start with a charge, an electric charge, moving through a magnetic field. Here's what you can draw in box one. If an electric charge is moving parallel or anti-parallel to a magnetic field, it feels no magnetic force. This was discovered through observation and experiment. Box number two. If an electric charge is moving perpendicular with respect to a magnetic field, it feels the maximum magnetic force possible. The magnitude of this force is a function of the charge's magnitude, the strength of the magnetic field, and the magnitude of its velocity. Box three shows an intermediate situation. You have a charge moving at some arbitrary angle with respect to a magnetic field. Box 4 summarizes all the empirical facts associated with an electric charge moving through a magnetic field. It turns out all of the behaviors described in box 4 can be summarized by a cross product. Remember, cross product is product of perpendiculars. So the first equation in box 5 shows you the vector relationship between the magnetic force, the electric charge magnitude, the velocity vector, and the magnetic field vector. The last three equations are giving you basically the magnitude angle version of the the cross product. You might wonder, if I use these last three equations, how do I figure out the direction? And we have a right-hand rule for that situation. Box number six is blank. It's basically just reminding you that when you deal with cross products, there's a whole set of rules and visuals that you should be aware of. You studied cross products before when you did angular momentum and torque analysis. Box seven talks about how to apply a right-hand rule to determine the relative orientations between the magnetic force, the charge's velocity vector, and the magnetic field vector. There's a couple of different ways to do this right hand rule. Here's my preferred method. Take your right hand and keep it flat. Point your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field vectors. Point your thumb in the direction of the charge velocity. In this case, we're looking at an electric current, which is nothing more than a whole bunch of charges moving in a given direction. Your palm is then pointing in the direction of the magnetic force. Here's an alternative way of making the same determinations. This is from the Bozeman Science YouTube channel. And so let's say we have a magnetic field like this. You can see that it's coming at us. To figure out where that magnetic force is acting, you have to use the right hand rule. And so it takes a second to get this figured out, but I'm gonna hold my fingers out like this. So I've got my index finger pointed out. That's gonna be the vector of the velocity. So in other words, where that charged particle is moving. I then have my middle finger moving at 90 degrees to that, and that's gonna be the magnetic field. And then the force is going to be your thumb. And so you try to make these three dimensions with your finger, and you can solve really intense problems like this. You might look like an idiot as you're doing that, but it's, it's worth it. And so let's say we have a charged particle that has no velocity and it's in this magnetic field. How big is our force going to be? Well, we're not gonna have a force. Again, if it's not moving, there's no force. And so let me give you a harder problem. Let's say we have a magnetic field like this and we have a charged particle, a positive particle that's moving up and to the left. And so how do you figure out where that magnetic force is going to be? Well, first of all, make your hand like this, and then you're gonna point your index finger in the direction of that moving charge. So I'm moving it up and to the left. Then you wanna make sure that your middle fig finger, that magnetic field, is pointed towards you, because you can see on this diagram that the field is coming towards us. And so once I've got that in order, my thumb is gonna show me the magnetic force, and so that's gonna go up and to the right. So that was pretty easy to solve. Let's go to another one. Now we've got a different magnetic field, and let's say that that charged particle, that proton, is moving from right to left. How do you solve this one? Again, stick your finger towards the left. That's the movement of the particle. Now the magnetic field is not coming towards you. It's going away from you. So I have to turn my hand like this. And now where's the magnetic force? Well, you can see that that's going to be acting down. What if we have one like this? So we've got a different magnetic field. What if we have an electron moving? Okay, so if you have an electron moving, there's two ways you can go at this. Number one, you could just use your right hand and then just turn the force around when you're done, or you've got a left hand, and the left hand's gonna work great. So I'm gonna put uh, my finger, point my index finger in the direction of the movement of the electron. The magnetic field, my middle finger, in this case, is gonna come at me. And so where's the force? Now the force is gonna be to the left. And so if you know the magnetic field and you know the direction, you can always figure out where that magnetic force is going to be. 
Box 7, 8, and 9 go into more details about right-hand rule and right-hand rule variations. For something like this, I'll refer you to your textbook. There is absolutely no shortage of additional YouTube videos that go into the finer points of various right-hand rules. We'll apply this a lot in homework problems. Refer to your textbook and other online resources to get acquainted with this. Having said that, here are two more labeled drawings giving you some right-hand rule reinforcement. And at the very bottom is the method of Sarah's matrix approach to solving cross products. Cross products is a key component of this chapter. Box 10, we introduce two new units, the Tesla and the Gauss. Make sure you follow along with the dimensional analysis, which is always a great practice to sanity check your problem solutions. It's always fun to look at the extremes. Coming in at the low end is five auto Tesla, 5 times 10 to the minus 18th Tesla. These are the magnetic fields involved in something called space-time frame dragging. When an object moves through space-time, it drags space-time with it. The magnetic field of a microwave oven, the magnetic field on Earth at a couple of different latitudes. Here is the magnetic field strength needed to levitate a frog. And here are the magnetic fields that exist within the relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Laboratory. Study this box really carefully. Magnetic field conventions. This is going to look a lot like electric field line conventions, but there are some very notable differences. The Hall effect is a really interesting phenomena, not just within the realm of theoretical physics, but there's a ton of practical applications and devices that are based on the Hall effect. Basically, it says when moving charges are subjected to a magnetic field, the force they're subjected to will alter their motion. In a metal, the free charge carriers are negative charges, typically electric Positive charges are fixed in place. So the magnetic field causes these negative charges to move, thereby causing a separation between positive and negative charges. So you have two simultaneous forces. You have the magnetic force, and now you also have an electric force because you have charge separation, which creates an electric field. These steps derive some really helpful equations that relate magnetic fields, electric fields, and voltage. Here's how a Hall effect sensor works. These devices are found everywhere. An external voltage source causes a current to flow which is subjected to an external magnetic field which causes it to deflect and create a voltage difference which in turn is read by this meter. If I reverse the direction of the magnetic field, same thing. Current deflects causes a voltage difference which is read by the meter. Everything is calibrated. I know the current, I know the voltage, which means I can determine the strength of the magnetic field. These devices are used in magnetic field sensors, which are found everywhere. Crossed fields, the discovery of the electron. This is a cathode ray tube, a CRT. It's how old school TVs used to work. A voltage source would pass current through this filament here. The filament would heat up so much, electrons would actually start to fly off the wire. Another voltage source accelerated these electrons to the right. They would pass between these two plates, which were connected to yet another voltage source. As they passed through these plates, they were subjected to a magnetic field, typically from a permanent magnet. Magnet. By adjusting the strengths of the magnetic field and the electric field that got created between these two plates, the particle beam, in this case electrons, could be steered. They could be directed to very specific locations. In this highlighted equation, V refers to velocity. A circulating charged particle. Charged particles moving in a circle has a lot of basic science relevance and also a lot of practical applications. If you throw a charged particle into a magnetic field, in this case the magnetic field is going into the page, and that particle has a velocity, it will be subjected to a force, F equals QV cross B force. So this particle starts to move in a circle, which means it's undergoing a centripetal acceleration. The force that's causing this centripetal acceleration is the magnetic force. So that's where we start off with box one. Follow boxes two and three. This is a really important formula. It relates the period of the particle's orbit, its mass, charge magnitude, and magnetic field strength. In box 4, I'm remembering the reciprocal relationship between frequency and period. And in box 5, I have an expression for omega, the angular frequency. This is circular motion, so angular frequency is a property I need to be aware of. Box 6, why is this omega called angular frequency? We sometimes refer to it as angular velocity. Frequency basically means something per time. In this case, we're talking about the amount of radians per time, or the amount of angular displacement per time. Hence 
hence the term angular frequency. Magnetic force on a current carrying wire in a uniform magnetic field. We can harness magnetic forces to do a lot of really useful work for us. We'll start with a magnetic force moving a wire. This is our first step into understanding how motors work, as well as a lot of other very practical everyday applications. Use your right hand rule, which means you point your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, in this case into the page. Your thumb points in the direction of the charge flow, or in this case the current flow, which is upward, and your palm points to the left, which is why this wire is bowing to the left. In the last picture, current is flowing down, so my thumb is pointing down, my fingers are pointing into the page because the magnetic field is still pointing into the page, and my palm is now facing to the right, which is why this wire bends to the right, or bows to the right. In box three, we're using basic kinematics to get an expression for velocity. And in box 4, we update the magnetic force, F subscript B equals QV cross B equation. This is a really important expression. It basically indicates the force acting on a current carrying straight wire in a uniform magnetic field. In box 5, we're relaxing the requirements. Instead of a straight current carrying wire in a magnetic field, it's any shaped current carrying wire in a constant magnetic field. It should be mentioned that the current in this case is itself constant as well. But the wire can be any shape whatsoever. Finally, we get to this expression. Any current carrying wire of any shape in a constant magnetic field is subjected to this force. Let's keep going with this. Here you see a constant current carrying wire exposed to a uniform magnetic field and the wire is shaped into a semicircle. Let's break this wire up into two components. The straight line segment component and then the semicircular component. For the straight line component, make sure you understand why the magnetic force exerted on this wire is 2RIB in the k-hat direction. Let's now study the arc or semicircular part of the wire. Study boxes 2 through 7 and notice that the net force acting on the arc portion of the wire is exactly opposite and equal to the force acting on the straight line portion of the wire. The moral of the story is for any closed current loop in a uniform magnetic field the net force acting on it is zero. Which begs the question how exactly does the magnetic force do work for us? The answer is torque. The net force might be zero, but the net torque produced is not zero. Now let's look at a current carrying rectangular loop exposed to a uniform magnetic field. One of the great things about this derivation is it's really going to reinforce your mastery of right hand rule applications. Make sure you go through it step by step. It also reminds us about torque. Remember torque is the product of perpendiculars and the perpendicular pairs are the torque arm and the applied force. The torque arm here equals B over 2 2 and the force comes from the magnetic force. Box 2 is showing the same wire but from a top-down view. Make sure you can see the correlation between this rectangular loop from a front perspective versus this top-down perspective. Take some more time and confirm with your right-hand rule that the forces are indeed in the direction indicated. So we conclude with box 5. The torque acting on this constant current carrying rectangular loop in a uniform magnetic field is equal to IAB, the value of the current times times the loop area times the magnetic field strength. We get the maximum torque acting on this rectangular loop when the loop itself is parallel to the magnetic field. Theta equals 90 degrees because we're going to take this angle to be between the surface normal vector and the magnetic field direction. So when the surface normal vector is at a 90 degree angle with respect to the direction of the magnetic field, that corresponds to the rectangular loop being parallel with the magnetic field lines. The next case we're going to consider is what happens when this loop is at some arbitrary orientation with respect to the magnetic field. Instead of the loop itself being physically parallel to the magnetic field lines, it's at some arbitrary angle. Follow along using your right hand rule and remembering that for a current carrying wire, F equals IL cross B, or in magnitude angle format, F equals ILB sine theta. Here you have multiple expressions all saying the same thing about the magnitude of the torque acting on a loop of wire in a magnetic field. Let me restate, the magnitude of the current is constant. The magnetic field is uniform. We did this derivation for a single loop of wire. If we have multiple loops of wire, like a coil for example, just multiply by n, the number of loops. Special focus to area vector determination. It restates what the surface normal is and conventions to use to find the specific angle between the area normal and the magnetic field. The product of n times a times the area vector 
occurs so frequently, we refer to it as the magnetic moment vector. You have to worry about magnitude, which is n times i times a, and you have to worry about direction. Here's the convention to use to determine direction. So here's your updated torque toolkit. This is your arsenal of equations to use when you need to analyze the torque on a current carrying wire in a uniform magnetic field. All fields store energy. The gravitational potential field provides gravitational potential energy. The electric field provides electric potential energy. And now we're going to look at the magnetic field, which provides magnetic potential energy. We're going to utilize the magnetic moment vector, or sometimes it's referred to as the magnetic dipole, and derive an expression for magnetic potential energy. We remember the work kinetic energy theorem, which says work equals the change in kinetic energy. We remember the little yellow ball demonstration, which shows us how as kinetic energy increases, potential energy decreases. This is universally true, not just for the little yellow ball. And now we have a specific expression that lets us calculate the magnetic field potential energy. Magnetic dipole moments, also known as magnetic moment vectors, figure very prominently in a lot of practical applications as well as exotic theoretical applications.